Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Stanford. My pleasure, Andre. So I guess we will start off with just asking what actually is neoliberalism and why are we seeing so many discussions at the moment about its failures? Neoliberalism is a term that gets thrown around a lot, but we don't always know exactly what it means. Um, it's kind of the term that we use to describe the current incarnation uh, of our economy and our economic policies. It's been around for about 30 years in most of the world. And I think of it as a kind of a tough love version of capitalism. Think of it as capitalism with the gloves off. Okay? For a while in the post-war decades, governments and employers were willing to share the wealth a little bit with workers and unions. They expanded social programs. They were committed to full employment and lifting wages. But starting around the late 70s, early 80s, that tolerance for workers and workers' interests started to evaporate. And uh, I guess it began with Margaret Thatcher in Britain, Ronald Reagan in America, and then it spread through much of the world uh, with very kind of hard-nosed right-wing leaders um, and a more aggressive position by employers that we're not going to give anything to the workers unless we're absolutely forced to. The results of 30 years of neoliberalism are obvious around us. We've had growing inequality, a widening gap between the 1 or 2 percent at the top and most of the rest of the people who are just striving to get by. Uh, we've seen attacks on social programs, uh, attacks on entitlements, and above all we've seen incredible attacks on unions. Uh, neoliberalism wants unions out of the way because unions are an organized force to defend working people against these sort of attacks. Okay, so what is the, the neoliberal approach to public services? How do they view public services? We often assume that neoliberals want to get rid of the government or shrink the government or go back to a sort of pure free market utopia where government wasn't involved. But that's not actually a correct interpretation of their strategy. Neoliberals generally like to have a strong central government. They just want that government to do other things than what working people have traditionally expected government to do. So instead of government providing public services and uh, helping to spread the wealth through the tax and transfer system, neoliberalism would prefer government to focus on doing things that support the business community and that make it easier for businesses to do profit. Uh, so uh, neoliberalism will support many of the things that government does, such as investing in infrastructure if it helps businesses operate more effectively and profitably. Uh, they'll certainly support government investing in skills and training so long as those skills and training are, are really focused on you know, getting job-ready graduates who can just walk into a job and that saves the employers from having to do uh, certs of various training and uh, upgrading. Uh, neoliberalism will support, obviously, the strong protection of private pro property, uh, even in abstract forms like patents or intellectual property. They want the government to have a long arm to go out there and make sure that private property is protected. Um, they also like government to police labor relations. You know, in Australia, think about it. Uh, look at our industrial relations system, which is one of the most tightly constrained and heavily policed uh, IR systems anywhere in the world. That doesn't represent government disappearing or shrinking or getting out of the way. That represents government being used to promote the interests of employers, in this case, by making it very difficult for unions to do what they're supposed to. So neoliberalism in general likes a government, a strong government, a government with power, but they would like it to be focused on meeting the needs of business rather than the needs of the whole population. Why, what are some of the economic reasons why professional workers have been campaigning against things like privatisation in the developed world? Mm -hmm. Another strategy of neoliberalism in regards to the government and public services is if there are parts of government that can be hived off to the private sector, they'll strongly support privatisation uh, because it creates new profit opportunities for private investors. Uh, there's no evidence, of course, that private ownership and private management make things more efficient. In fact, quite to the contrary, just look at Australia's electricity system or look at our vocational education system uh, or other things that have been privatized and are just in a mess uh, today. So it isn't about efficiency in any regard. What it is is about creating good opportunities for investors to put in money and, and make good profits. 
Um, now, professional workers have a big stake in trying to stop privatization because once something is handed over to the private sector, uh, it's very, very challenging for uh, workers involved in those services or those uh, enterprises uh, to protect their living standards, to protect their incomes, uh, to stand up against sort of the downsizing or offshoring or outsourcing of their work that private owners typically want to do. Uh, so it's quite logical that uh, professional workers in all kinds of public service applications, whether it's healthcare or education or uh, utilities, um, have always tried to say, no, 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 we've got to keep these things within the public fold. It's more accountable. Uh, it means higher quality service to the users of public services. And it means we've got a, ch a fighting chance to preserve the quality of our jobs. So uh, what are some of the positive economic outcomes that come from a state having mm -hmm. a strong, highly educated contingent of workers employed within a public service? It's really important to think about the economic benefits of public services. Uh, neoliberals often portray public services as if it's, uh, you know, you're just shoveling money into a giant black hole in the ground. It's a, just a waste of money. It's a drain. It's a cost. Well, of course, government has to pay for these things, but there are economic benefits associated with public service provision. Of course, first and foremost, you're delivering a service that's valuable for the people who use it, whether it's education or health care or cultural programs or infrastructure. That contributes to the quality of life of Australians. But there's also the economic benefits associated with a high quality, high skill public sector workforce delivering those things. For example, think about the incomes that public sector workers get for doing their job. You know, the incomes reflect their skills and their productivity, uh, their, their fair and legitimate payment to public sector workers. Well, what do they do with that money when they get it? They go out and spend it, just like anybody else. And the economic stimulus that's provided by injecting money into the economy, including through hiring people to deliver public services, is absolutely essential to Australia's uh, economic growth. And we've seen the case of governments that have kind of taken a short-sighted view and said, oh no, we must uh, reduce the deficit, we're going to cut spending, we're going to lay off uh, public sector workers, we're going to freeze their wages, that's a very common response. They end up shooting themselves in the foot because you're undermining economic growth and aggregate demand by taking billions of dollars out of the money, uh, out of the economy, through this artificial suppression of public sector incomes. Uh, so I think it's really important for public sector workers, public service providers and unions to in enhance uh, understanding among Australians about how these services are not just a cost, they're a benefit, and they actually support economic growth. Uh in WA today, you've probably um, seen quite a lot of the, the news discussion about our bleak budget situation. Mm -hmm. um, there's even been speculation about a contraction of workers within the public service. What are you, your thoughts on this situation and what sort of uh, insights or warnings do you have about the state possibly adopting austerity measures? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really important that we push hard against a kind of knee-jerk austerity reaction to any kind of budget deficits that might spring up because of a downturn in the private sector economy. It's clear what caused the deficit in WA. It was the decline in the mining industry and the recession that resulted in the state because of that. Now, when a government is faced with a deficit because of a recession, the absolute worst thing to do is to try and cut their way out of that deficit because by cutting public programs, cutting public services, laying off public sector workers, guess what you're doing? you're making the recession even worse because now in addition to mining sector workers and others who've lost their jobs now you could have thousands of public sector workers who've lost their jobs as well and that can feed back into further weakness in the government's own um, budget situation so uh, the role of government when the private sector economy goes into a recession is not to jump on the bandwagon and make things worse the role of government is to swim against those tides and try to stimulate some economic activity rather than contracting their own operations uh, in response to, uh, to the downturn. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's very important that governments do not jump on a sort of short-term austerity bandwagon. We've seen in other countries, such as in Greece, for example, where governments with a big deficit tried to cut their way out and only made it worse. Uh, WA's debt is not large, uh, it is manageable, and it can be, the, the budget can be balanced by getting the economy back on its feet, not by slashing and burning public services. Dr. Jim Stanford, thank you so much for talking to The Journal. It was my pleasure, Andre. Thank you for having me.